to take care of themselves. And it seems that it might work. Yeah. So my question is, and you kind of uh, touched on the subject with the map. Let's say I got a nice lot in suburbia, you know, with zoned R10. I got CCNR in place. How do I get a permit for one of these buildings? Um, move. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have, the truth is, there are, that's why we're mapping it, is because there are, it's amazing, every, I mean, I was amazed, that's just the beginnings of the map that we had there, and it shows about 50-50. Well, what was the white stuff, the red and the green? The white was, we just haven't mapped it yet. Uh -huh. The red was codes and, and regulations, the green was no codes and regulations, and even in the code part, we're going to have to refine the map, because even in the code part, these buildings meet code, they meet and exceed code, so... Even in the code part, you're talking. Uh, maybe they'll raise a few eyebrows, but they'll, you know, they'll go, they'll, they'll pass it. Maybe make you jump through a couple of hoops or something, or a sign off, or a variance, or whatever. There's only a few places that you should actually stay away from in terms of living. And but you can get a permit in most cases with a professional architect or engineer signing off. And then of course there are those green places that are just I cannot believe how many they are. Uh, that you can do whatever you want. And so in a subdivision, if you've already got the land and everything, then you are into going through the codes, but uh, I've been doing that for decades. It used to be absolutely ridiculous, and now with you know every passing day, there's something going down with the planet. They're, they're going, uh, well, let's look at this a little harder. And that's what's happening in New York City. Ten years ago, if I tried to do this in New York City, I wouldn't have gotten the first base. Now, we've already gone through the first two meetings with the Department of Buildings, and one of them said, uh, one of the guys on the board said, I want this building for myself. <laughs> Another one says, you are going to get a permit. We are going to use this as a method of evolving our codes to meet sustainability halfway. I mean, I'm seeing, I'm, 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 I'm you know, uh, uh, aghast at the, at the changes that are happening because of the, the fear. They're scared now. So you could probably get a, a permit uh, uh, with jumping through a few hooks, uh, but it is a lot easier, you know, out in the boonies. If I can say something to this, no? for example, in Czech Republic, it's, uh, the easy way to do this is don't call it house. Yeah. It's exactly as you said before. <laughs> don't call it house. Call it uh, the chicken house. Right? <laughs> call, it, call it a greenhouse. It's a food production yeah. place, and you put yourself a hammock up in it. I mean, the, the building I showed you, the main one, it's got more space for plants than, than people anyway. So there's a lot of different, you call it, and, and uh, like we're obviously going to, we have been literally invited to do one here in, uh, in Prague. And, uh, and if that is there, that will, that will open it up. Because when the officials go in and they, they see this building takes no utilities whatsoever, then they're going to burn it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when you build a system like this, what's the higher, which part is the most costly part? I can imagine that building in Sierra Leone or Jamaica is much more uh, cheaper than, than in the US, for example. So uh, when you get all the recycled materials, well, for what exactly do you have to pay? What is the higher cost? Well, you still have to pay uh, for l some lumber, cement, rebar, glass, uh, insulation. I mean, it, it, it depends on, see, the, the, we, we were achieving the same thing in Haiti with scrap insulation from the streets of Port-au-Prince. Well, uh, there are things in a third world country that you can do that they won't let you do in, in a developed country. So part of it is your codes and regulations are going to make you use uh, certified insulations and certified things. So uh, even if you do get to use the garbage and so you're, you're talking about a certain amount of materials and a certain amount of equipment. I mean, the power system for the $400,000 house costs $30,000 to power a house in the regular way with pressurized water and refrigeration and everything that a normal house has. So its power system is probably your biggest expense. And then uh, materials. And then the, the $400,000 one has paid labor. You know, the Haiti one had free labor. I mean... 
by, by doing this yourself, as uh, if we make this simple enough for people to do themselves, which we are, then you're saving labor, and you're trading and whatever for your labor, and you're buying less materials because you're using, you know, there's 45% recycled materials in these things, not, not a, a, a full 100%. So you're, it depends on uh, your size of your building, your climate, your codes and regulations that you're able to get through or not, or, or, or have to conform to. So there's a lot of variables, but I'm, I showed the two extremes. I showed the one on the left that was code passed, uh, certificate of occupancy, passed the electric code, passed the plumbing code, banks will loan on it, total meeting today's real world home situation, but in a totally off-grid, sustainable way that uses no utilities. That's what you have to go through, $400,000. That's what a regular house costs in New Mexico. And then I showed what you can do in Haiti, which is the other extreme. You would be, if you were building somewhere around here, somewhere in between that, depending on you and what you could get in, through your own head of what you could live with, your codes and regulations and your materials and your climate and so on. So I show both extremes and advise people go to the one on the right as much as you can. And I have one more question if yeah. I could have your voice now. Um, I don't know if I got it right, but uh, as I understood, you said that's the same, more or less the same technology, uh, no matter which part of the world you build. Uh, but you mentioned the costs are different. Uh, uh, in different parts, in, in different climates. So, uh, what is the main difference between house like this, a system like this, being built in Haiti and being, being built in northern Norway? And if I could st still grow bananas in northern Norway, for example. Yeah. Uh, well, they, the, the cold, the tropical climates are going to be cheaper because you can go outside to your shower and you can go outside to your toilet, separate little rooms. And it's actually nice to go outside. So the tropical climates are cheaper. The northern climates, the colder climates, have to have uh, uh, every, you know, your plumbing, your toilet has to be inside so the toilet won't freeze and break. Mm -hmm. So you, the, the colder climates take a little more, you know, say. So if you could do one for $25,000 US in uh, tropics, it would cost 40 in a cold climate. But still, 40 is better than 400. And so you're, we're, we're, I didn't show it because uh, uh, it's new and I haven't uh, threaded it in yet, but we have a cold climate version of the Haiti building. And we're, I've got half the people on my staff want it because it's, it's cheap, it's easy. And uh, so we're, that'll, that's up and coming, in other words, to show the least expensive way to go about this. And a, a, a lot of it is, I mean, you know, I. I 25 years ago, when I, or 30 years ago, when I first started talking about <coughs> building a building out of tires, that was radical. And it was, people were just, you know, building out of garbage, and you're an idiot, and you're incompetent, and you should be put in jail, and we're taking your license, and all kinds of stuff for building with tires. Well, now, we're recycling, and it's a big green word, and everybody's all happy. Well, now, I should be happy too, but I'm not, because now I'm talking about bucket showers and bucket flush. How many, you know, how many people are going to sell that to their mother? You know, <laughs> you know no bucket flush for me. But the thing is, when it comes down to $30,000 difference in price for a, a, a flush or a bucket flush, you know, and lots less water being used, which means lots less sewage having to be dealt with. I mean, the whole thing, it just makes sense. And the reason I stayed, the reason I hated bucket showers was because they were so grimy and, and unpleasant. Well... I just said, okay, I'll just make a bucket shower that's pleasant. You know, it's just like, once you accept that that's the way, you can make it pleasant, you can make it beautiful. So I'm, yeah, I'm talking all over the world about bucket flush and bucket shower, and people are going, oh, God, the guy's over the hill. <laughs> get him out of here. But, you know, it's like, the, we're, we have to keep going. You can't relentlessly keep going in the direction of using less. Not only for the planet. People think they're saving the planet. To hell with the planet. I'm saying, I'm saving my ass, you know, I'm trying to give myself a life, and then, and, and, and if my life is easier, then it's obviously going to be easier on the planet. I'm just looking at the planet as an extension of myself, 
you know, uh, it, it, which it is. There's a there's an extremely important point there that that if you are very healthy, totally fit and in shape and everything, and you've got a a, a cancer on your hand, just because it's on your hand, you can put it behind your back. You know, I'm well, I'm happy, but it's affecting your whole bloodstream, your whole system, your whole everything. Well, that's the that's that's the way it is with the planet. It's not like a moral, ecological issue of saving the planet. It's if there's trouble anywhere on the planet in terms of war, in terms of nuclear power plants melting down, in terms of anything. It's, I can't put it behind my back. It's affecting me. It's affecting my life. And so I'm just like trying to make my life better, to hell with everything else. Thank you. So you basically move air and play with the condensation engine, and, I mean a convection engine, to, to uh, basically uh, align with the condensation process. So humidity is dealt with uh, without uh, equipment, you know. I mean, uh, when, we, when we were, we've actually done, uh, uh, you know, followed the process of a, of a manufactured dehumidifier, uh, but only in the whole building. So dehumidification is uh, is, is uh, dealt with with moving air. Anything else? Yeah. Have yeah. you ever thought about doing some uh, mini grids, like some smart grid applications, to uh, uh, to do some cost reduction on the electrical part, to share a common PV ray field and have like just one larger inverter? Well, the, you're, we're dealing with people, yeah. and that's the problem. Uh, <laughs> When you share you electricity, some, huh? Do you use some clever energy management for some energy dispensers or whatever to avoid someone using the energy of all the others? Yeah. It might work. But well, you can you can cluster them, and but the thing is, uh, you, you 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 have to have one person's house shut off if they're using too much power because you're dealing with minimal amounts of power. But see, the thing is, we uh, we've gotten the power system down to like the power system for Haiti was $400. Runs the house. I mean, it's not worth the arguments with people using too much power and trying to kill their neighbor for running 